12 has announced it's going to a 10-game football schedule, which means two non-conference games are getting lopped off. But less than a month before some seasons are supposed to start, there remains some confusion about the opponents. Now, there's a lot of confusion about where college sports stand at the moment. Welcome to Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Star's daily sports podcast. It's Wednesday, August 5th. I'm Blair Kirkhoff, and on today's show, beat writers Jesse Newell and Kellis Robinette discuss where things stand in the Big 12 and at Kansas and Kansas State. The Wildcats have a starting date, but haven't announced an opponent. KU has announced an opponent, but are the Jayhawks really going to play Southern Illinois on August 29th, some three weeks from now? After a break, Kellis and Jesse take a look back at some great basketball moments in the building formerly known as Sprint Center. With the corporate merger, it's now known as T-Mobile Center, so I asked our beat writers to recall the best moments in Sprint Center for the teams that they cover. So, here we go, talking Big 12, K-State, and KU with Callis Robinette and Jesse Newell. Okay, guys, it's already been a somewhat of a busy day on the college news front. We have learned, uh, we're recording this around 1045 on, on Wednesday morning, and we've already learned that University of Connecticut is not having a football season this year, and we have seen the Big Ten's football schedule, their 10-game all-conference football schedule that was released this morning. I think there'll be more news today, later today on from the NCAA about fall sports in, um, in Divisions 2 II and 3. Uh, so these are, these are busy times. And, and look, in, in first week in August, we'd be we'd – be, talking about KU starting quarterback or K-State's um, prospects of following up a bowl season in year two of Chris Kleiman. Instead, we're, we're talking about adjusting schedules and, and, and other topics in the, in, this, uh, in, the, in the COVID-19 landscape. So the Big 12 did make news earlier this week with its football news. Callis, why don't you take us through that? You, you ended up writing the story on that. But So what, what, is, the big, what is the Big 12 going to do football schedule-wise this season? Well, they're going to try to have a season at uh, a little bit smaller number of games than usual. So instead of 12, which is what a lot of people wanted and what schools were planning for with teams like Kansas already starting preseason camp, um, they're going to drop down and go with 10. And that means they're going to have the full round robin, nine games, and then each team can play one non-conference opponent. Um, I guess it, it, at this point, we don't know when those games are going to be played, but Schools can figure out who they want to add, keep on their schedule, who they want to add to their schedule, and, and move on from there. Um, it, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if games actually end up getting played, but this system actually lines up pretty well with every other conference. The Big Ten is going 10 games, the ACC going 10 games with their new conference only schedule. So this aligns the Big 12 with every other power conference and that they're going to try to get 10 games in, and they've created some flexibility for themselves by saying that teams can, um, I guess, start before uh, conference play begins uh, in, in mid to late September, whenever they want. And then they'll have a little bit of leeway late in the season on when they actually hold the championship game. It could be December 5th, December 12th, December 19th in Arlington, Texas, just depending on how many makeup games they need to get in. Um, that again is uh, guessing that we do have a season, which is still up in the air at this point, but that's the plan for now going 10 games and it's a uh, brave new world right now. It is, and I think I saw where Bob Bowlesby said that the the conference season will start somewhere in mid to late September. So that would be uh, that would give Big Twelve uh, programs an opportunity to play that non conference game before, and I, I imagine that'll happen for all of them. The the uh, the non conference game scheduled before conference play starts, and the ACC and the and the Big Twelve with uh, nine conference games with with a plus one of a non conference. The other ones, I believe, Pac twelve, SEC, and Big Ten, just conference games only for um, you know for the for the schools in those leagues. And the SEC is not going to start until the weekend of September twenty six. So there is some similarities in the number of games everybody's going to play, which I kind of like and. You know, I've always I've always wondered what uh, what a college football season would be like if everybody played similar number of games in, in in you know one conference game difference between the major conferences. But there there are different starting points and and maybe ending points for college football. Let's let's get back to the non conference part of this thing because it does affect everybody in, in in the league and especially Kansas, which has a game scheduled for this month later this month August 29th. 
Um, don't know. Oh, we do know who, right? Southern Illinois, Jesse. But um, uh, so is Kansas going to be ready to play on August 29th? <laughs> well, they're practicing like they're going to be ready to play, but it seems unlikely the game is going to take place then because of all the things you guys just talked about. If the conference season is starting in late September, you can't have this or aren't likely to have this floating game at August 29th and then take the next month of the season off. Um, it just doesn't seem to make much sense. And uh, I know Pete Thamel of uh, Yahoo Sports reported yesterday that his sources or that Kansas is, quote, unlikely to open its season in week zero now against Southern Illinois. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. The flip side of that, of course, for Kansas is to going, when you go to this new model, when you go to this conference-only setting, if this thing is going to happen, uh, that's not really great news for Kansas. You know what I mean? Because they're looking at potentially, like most years, and especially this year, where they did a very smart thing in the offseason. They took 25 high school players in their recruiting class. They're trying to build this thing up the right way, but because of that, you're going to have some short-term suffering. You know what I mean? They lost some good players from last year. They didn't really replace them with talented, experienced Juco guys or anything like that. So KU could struggle to win some games this year, and usually your best chances of winning are those non-conference games. And obviously Kansas had a pretty nice non-conference schedule set up this year in having originally uh, it was New Hampshire at home, Boston College at home, who they beat last year at Boston College, and then at Coastal Carolina, which they lost to Coastal Carolina last year, but that game on the road is going to be about one of the friendliest F. Uh, BS games that you could potentially get. So now Kansas, instead of having three non-conference opponents, is potentially only going to have one. It seems probable that they probably want to keep this game with Southern Illinois if they can reschedule it. Again, that's going to depend on Southern Illinois and kind of the the hoops they have to jump through and what their season is going to look like. But I would definitely expect Kansas to try to remain um, with some sort of FCS opponent in that week one game. Because again, um, if this season is played out completely, then KU is not going to have a great chance to win any of its big 12 games. Maybe they can sneak one or two in and surprise some people, but uh, you probably want to get one at least on the scoreboard. And to do that, you're going to have to try to take on somebody who you're going to be a heavy favorite against. So for KU, that's probably going to be searching the FCS market, whether that remains Southern Illinois or not. I guess we just don't know at this point. I think a lot of teams are going to end up using an FCS opponent as that plus one game. Um, I believe Texas is going to end up with UTEP just because uh, they're in state. They're already on the schedule and it makes sense for them. But like, yeah, Kansas are going to be probably Southern Illinois. I bet Oklahoma sticks with uh, Missouri state as their non-conference opponent. And I think Kansas state probably uh, rotates towards North North Dakota as it's non-conference opponent here. And poor Texas Tech is actually left with nobody. Everybody that they were supposed to play is canceled on them, so I don't know what they're going to do. It's a, it, it's an interesting thing how this all worked out. Like a team like Iowa State was sitting here looking at their dream schedule. I mean, uh, they finally got Iowa off the non-con, and they were going to play South Dakota at home, Ball State at home, UNLV at home, Texas Tech at home, go on the road to Kansas, and that was what their first five games were going to be. So they really wanted to play those 12 games, and get this great start going in and now teams have to adjust and figure out what in the world to do. Yeah. That, that Oklahoma Missouri state game is scheduled for the same day as Kansas SIU, right? That August 29th. So KU and Oklahoma are, are, are have been practicing. And, yeah, and, and TCU has been practicing too, even without an opponent on their schedule. <laughs> that, that shows you how well organized all this is right now. And we know, we know TCU's been practicing because Gary Patterson got a little hot water earlier this week with, uh, you know, had to apologize for, uh, for words uttered in practice. So we know they're on the practice field at least. At, uh, or, or I guess in this case, they didn't come to the practice field. Players didn't come that day because of something he said. But, um, well, what a – how, uh, how scattered this all is, right? I mean – uh, you know, here we are uh, wondering about who teams are going to play, and we're not 100% sure there is going to be a season, uh, of, at least a fall season. I've got a partial list uh, of uh, football seasons that we know are not going to be played in 2020, or at least in the fall of 2020, and I'll read them really quick. Uh, the Ivy is one. No fall sports in the Ivy League. That's They're classified as FCS. The National Junior College Athletic Association, so Butler, Hutch, you know, the the schools that we're also familiar with here has moved their season to the fall. The NAIA has moved its championship to the fall. They have a uh, 16-team 
championship bracket that's going to be played in, in or I'm sorry, moved to the spring, and that's going to be played in the spring. Some schools are electing to keep their fall schedule in the NAIA, but the championship's going to be in the spring. And also, the, um, the, the these are the only these are the two high school associations I've seen that have moved from fall to spring, and that's Illinois and Colorado. Kansas voted recently to keep their fall schedule uh, intact. So, you know, and, and again, as I mentioned at the start of the show, Connecticut has dropped its – Connecticut, with had, which had four, five, six, something like that, power five conference opponents on the schedule. I know Virginia, North Carolina, Illinois among them, uh, they just decided not to play a season. And um, – uh, and, and again, the, the uh, we don't know what the schedules are for any other conference uh, except for the Big Ten. So uh, right now, so it is a um, it, it, it's kind of a mess and a lot of uncertainty. Did you guys were you guys um, uh, did, did did it just make sense for the Big Twelve to fall in line with the other conferences after uh, after they were the last of the Power Five to announce a ten game schedule? Um, I, I think they wanted to hold out as long as they could to try to play 12, uh, but they kind of had to go to 10, didn't they, when everybody else did? I think so. Um, you know, 12 games right now, as practical as that, uh, you know, as, as good as that sounds from a certain standpoints, it's just kind of reckless when everybody else is dropping games, you're going to go ahead and play 12, especially with really no uh, unity and who teams are playing in those games because it seems like the one thing everybody wants to control right now is testing protocol and quarantine rules and everything like that. So to uh, have every team, your conference playing opponents from three different conferences, just on their own schedule, trying to figure that out logistically was going to be very difficult. Um, You know, I was, uh, I would have thought the safer move would have just been to go nine and not have a non-conference game, but that opens up um, some, some, problems in that if you have that few games you don't have much tv inventory and then you're giving up uh really your your one main source of income this season so they didn't want to go down to that few games um a lot of people wanted to go 12 i I think 10 is probably the best compromise um it just depends on who everybody lines up for that last game to see how well it works i'll tell you one thing that i've thought about with the with this new scheduling news that's come out over the last week for the power five conferences is some some schools are just going to get lucky, right? Missouri State, Southern Illinois, um, UTEP, they're going to get a payday out of this, and that's going to help their their bottom line. And we know how uh, how, how much of a financial challenge this college season is going to be the the academic year for all colleges, no matter no matter your size, it's going to be a challenge. Kansas announced a, what, a, what Jesse was it a twenty percent uh, reduction in in budgeting this year? Was, did I see that right? Yeah, that was the anticipated, but I mean, let's be honest, it's going to be worse than that. It's going to be yeah, worse than that everywhere. So uh, I think what Kansas did is sort of what we're starting to see across the nation a little bit. I know Iowa State kind of started this with their announcement. They just kind of wrote an open letter to their fans and to their supporters to say, hey, we're in trouble, you know, like well, we really need your help. Um, and and that's what Iowa State started by doing, like, hey, these are the facts. These are the numbers. This is why it's difficult. We'd appreciate your support during this time. This is why the, you don't have answers. And so a couple weeks ago, Jeff Long came forward sort of with his own email that kind of laid out, hey, this is where the budget is. This is what they anticipate. Even if things go well, it's down this much. Here's how you're trying to deal with it. And uh, I think I just saw another one online that – uh, there was another athletic department out there, a Power Five one, that was anticipating one hundred million dollars uh, in, yeah, in Wisconsin. losses. Yeah, Wisconsin. If it if it didn't happen, so yeah, that's just the reality of the situation right now. Um, and so it's yeah, it's 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 difficult. I, I, I it's that losing that type of money. Uh, I know that's got to be daunting for these athletic directors, these programs, these athletic departments, and especially when you're looking up and down the hallway and you're seeing all these people that are relying upon you to have jobs uh, because we know athletic departments, they, <laughs> they have lots of people that work for them, that sort of thing. But um, at the same time, you know, I, I feel like the big 12, you kind of mentioned it, Blair, I think more than anybody, they've kind of been the ones that have tried to just put their head down and keep this thing going. It's almost like uh, whenever you go to Maui Invitational, there's this big rock that you can jump off of 
uh, you know, kind of like a little cliff sort of thing. And you always see, you know, I think K basketball players, whether they sneak out and do it or not, I think they don't have to sneak out, but they, they go up there and they jump off, but it's like somebody you've taken up there and they really don't want to jump. But you know, the longer you stand there and the longer <laughs> you look at the water and the longer you think about, well, it's, I'm up here already, you know, it'd be really tough to get down now. It's like, it feels to me like the big 12 is kind of standing on that rock and, and, and they just kind of are standing there, you know, like they, they don't want to climb back down. They just figure that they sort of have to take the plunge at this point. And I think the longer you wait on this decision, the longer you think about it, the more likely you're just kind of, kind of stay with the status quo and figure that jumping into the water is going to be your best option because you stood there a long time and thought about it. So uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, like you said, there's lots of things that are happening minute to minute, day to day, and schools that are opting out, leagues that are opting out. But it just seems like the Big 12 and, and maybe some of the Power 5 in general is kind of just stuck standing on that rock, and they might figure out that the longer they stand on there, the more they just sort of convince themselves that they're going to have to take this leap. Well, speaking of someone who has jumped off that rock, there you uh, go. I would say go ahead and do it because it, it's pretty fun. I did that a lot of times. <laughs> Kansas State was there a few years ago. Um, but yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I think it's just interesting that schools like the Ivy League and the junior colleges that don't, you know, this isn't a real moneymaker for them. It's it, it's just kind of funny to see the contrast and that they can go ahead and say, you know what, it's a smart decision not to play. So that's what we're going to do. And then these power conferences that have a lot of money at stake and employees to keep employed and um, players they want to get out in the field and fans they want to get in the stands, they feel the pressure to move forward really in any way possible. So I think they're certainly at least going to try to have a season, whether it, you know, starts or finishes. I really couldn't tell you, but yeah, they're they're at this point, you know, whether it's the smart decision to walk back down that rock or not. I think they're all going to at least attempt to jump. Well, a couple things else I've noticed today. Uh, there's a on social media, Big Ten uh, players. There's more than a thousand, according to this tweet, and, and it makes sense. More than a hundred players in a program. There's fourteen big. Big Ten programs say that they uh, they're kind of banding together to demand uh, the, the the quality health protocols um, and and, uh, and I noticed that the Big Ten in its release of the schedule today did list its uh, its health protocols testing twice a week for football and and um, and we'll, we'll see if that satisfies the players. And the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, Ralph Russo, the the Associated Press college football writer put out a tweet about 10 or 15 minutes ago saying that the NCAA is telling members that if half the schools competing in a sport in any division cancel or postpone that sport, there won't be a fall championship held. Now that doesn't include football, obviously, because there is no division one football championship bracket for, you know, that's NCAA sponsored, but for other fall sports, what soccer, uh, volleyball falls under that. Uh, if, if there's, if those get pushed into spring or whatever that, uh, uh, there won't be a, a championship. Decisions have to be made by August 21st, uh, according to the NCAA. So, yeah, uh, as as Jesse was saying, things are uh, happening quickly and and by the minute these days. And I, I guess we kind of we, we could have expected this back in 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 uh, May and June when we were wondering about fall sports and and college football and how it was going to be handled. So, hey, let's take a quick break, and when we come back with uh, Jesse Newell and Kellis Robinette, I've got some. Uh, just a couple of other uh, questions for them that don't necessarily pertain to COVID-19. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners, unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Stars award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site and it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at 50 bucks, unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star, and that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. We are back with Callis Robinette and Jesse Newell, who cover K-State and KU for the Kansas City Star and Wichita Eagle. And guys, I know we can talk a long time about what we don't know uh, when it comes to the college sports landscape, and we're all waiting for for news. But I wanted to ask you a couple of questions that are 
I don't know. Just um, we might be asking under any circumstance. Um, and and uh, Callis, I'll start with you. There's another locket coming to Kansas State. <laughs> how, how many lockets are there, for gosh sakes? Uh, I believe Kevin uh, has three more. Uh, three, uh, yeah, he has three young children who aren't in college yet. So Tyler Lockett still has three three younger siblings. And they've gone ahead and they've offered Sterling Lockett, his oldest one. He's a junior at uh, Blue Valley there in the Kansas City area. So it's still a little bit uh, early to forecast exactly how good of a college player he might be. Kansas State's his first offer. But shoot, just based on the last name alone, you got to be the first school out there offering him. you got to take a flyer on, on that kid, given that uh, Aaron Lockett, Kevin Lockett, and Tyler Lockett are three of the top five receivers in Kansas State history. So very cool thing there. I, I saw, um, you know, kind of earlier or later last month that he was starting to pop up on their recruiting radar. And I figured it was just a matter of time before they they offered him um, his uh, his grandfather actually had a great line. I think it was to the Tulsa world many, many years ago. Um, he said that right after Sterling Lockett was born, he said something along the lines of that, uh, you know, he's he's just starting to learn how to walk. And as far as I'm concerned, he's already committed to Kansas State. So <laughs> well, we'll get to see if, that, uh, if that happens here, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Well, I enjoyed reading your story about him where um, uh, it was it six years ago when Tyler finished at Kansas State uh, with, with the records that he had broken uh, of his dad saying, I'm not. I may not hold these for long because Sterling, who at the time what had to be in the like sixth or seventh grade, right, is is coming along. So, and uh, yeah. By the way, I'm, I'm sitting about a mile from where Sterling goes to to high school at, at Blue Valley High. So, hey, uh, Kellis, who we I asked I actually asked this rhetorically earlier, but now I kind of want to know what Kansas football has started. We haven't heard from any Kansas coaches, um, uh, including Les Miles. We would. In a, in a typical year, we would have had Big 12 Media Day. KU would have had its own Media Day, but we haven't um, had, a, had a Zoom call on either of those. But the the topic of the starting quarterback would have come up um, uh, often in, in any kind of press conference situation. So, um, so I guess we don't really know much beyond what we left spring with, or, or not even we didn't even leave spring, entered spring with with uh, with the KU candidates. How, do we? Not really, no. Um, so f- just kind of handicap that race right now. Um, I think Kansas made pretty clear that they would have. I just talked about, hey, the 25 freshmen that KU took in its class. Um, that happened all after Felipe Franks, who was a Florida grad transfer, visited Kansas and seemed like a heavy Kansas lean before going to a different school. So KU was going to take its one scholarship that was going to be on an older player, and they were ready to give it to a potential quarterback for this upcoming season. Again, it didn't end up happening, but I think it sort of speaks to the state of the quarterback position, which is probably the greatest hope for it is just offensive coordinator Brent Deerman and what he's able to do with the offense last year, the potential that he's maybe able to put that quarterback in a good position. But Right now, you have to think that the two candidates, as we would have thought going into the spring, are Miles Kendrick uh, and almost also Thomas McVitie. Uh, Miles Kendrick played some two years ago, did not play last year, but uh, he's a former JUCO guy. He's kind of smaller, 5'9", 5'10", uh, can run a little bit, but probably not as mobile as you might think. But uh, probably consider the favorite in this. Like I said, he has some experience with KU, and uh, Brent Deerman seemed to have liked some of the things that he did last season. And then Thomas McVitie is who they brought in last year and ended up only throwing one pass. Uh, they brought him in as the prohibitive starter, and then he ended up losing the job to Carter Stanley. So uh, he's more uh, a guy. He can run, too, uh, more like straight-line speed when you get going. Maybe not as much wiggle to him, but... Uh, he's 6'5", 225, uh, kind of a bigger guy, but has battled accuracy issues and picking up the offense, that sort of thing. So as I'd handicap it now, I'd probably say that Miles Kendrick would be the favorite. He'd be the guy to expect to start in a game one for Kansas. The other thing is you just can't rule out Jalen Daniels. Uh, he's a true freshman coming in. He's one of the guys that Brent Dearman had his eye on uh, late in the process last year. And Listen, crazier things have happened. You know, if, if you're not getting the results from the guys that you think you're going to get them from, then potentially there's always the possibility for some guy to step into spring camp and really impress you to start off with. That'd be a lot to ask Jalen Daniels to do, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't throw him into that quarterback conversation here. But if you're asking me right now, Miles Kendrick is probably the guy for Kansas in game one. Like I said, Brent Dearman seems to have liked some of the stuff he did last year and potentially what he could bring to the Jayhawks moving forward. 
Okay. You know, when we get around to talking about teams in this way, right, uh, projecting how they might do, a uh, quarterback will be the obvious story at Kansas, but I, I think they're – the bigger issue may be the defense, because at least they have some offensive weapons at, at, uh, at the skill positions. Uh, defense is where they're going to really need to find some answers uh, as, uh, um, as, as they approach the season. So, hey, uh, one last thing, and this is for both of you. Uh, I, don't know if you I don't know if you heard this, but it's official. There is no longer a Sprint Center in downtown Kansas City. It is now officially the T-Mobile Center. And um, and so I was. I want to ask each of you the best moment that you can recall. I'm kind of springing it on you here. I, I know you didn't think about it much, but the best moment you can recall for for Kansas and Kansas State in the building that has formerly known as Sprint Center. I think they've had some good moments. Each each program has, and you've been covering the teams while the in in the um, this since the Sprint Center opened in in 2007. So. Uh, Jesse, let's start with you. What, what, uh, what, how about KU's best moment at uh, at Sprint Center? Man, yeah, you are springing it on me. I, I'm trying to rack my brain. I know I'm going to forget one, just since it's off the top of my head. But I'm thinking of four right away, actually. Um, okay. Now that you say it, so there was the game a few years back uh, where they were playing the Sweet 16 Elite Eight games, and they just railroaded Purdue. Uh, I don't know if you remember that one, Blair, but. My goodness, yep. they had a second half to remember. Devontae Graham was hitting threes everywhere. And that that building usually is pretty dead, and it was rocking. And there was just sort of this sense then, obviously it did not come to fruition following the, the next game against Oregon, but there was just sort of a sense there in the building that this Kansas team was going to make the Final Four and potentially make a deeper run than that. Along with NCAA tournament games, I'd have to go back to look up the exact year on this one, but KU also played a pretty entertaining game against North Carolina in the Sprint Center in the NCAA tournament uh, I believe it was, I'm looking up right now, 2013. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they won 70 to 58. Uh, but the same sort of thing. KU got behind early and then um, the building does not always and doesn't usually honestly come to life for Kansas. But in that particular instance, it did. And that was another one of those games where KU went on sort of a surge. I'm looking at the first 10 minutes of the second half. KU went on a 29 to 8 run over North Carolina. And uh, again, the building came to life. Two just individual things that I can think of, the moments that kind of, I think, make your jaw drop a little bit. Uh, Joel Embiid had one of his greatest performances at the Sprint Center. Yeah. It was playing against, now was it Utah? Uh, now I have to look it up again because my memory is not great, but uh, that was when he performed his dream shake uh, against the, the Utah, I believe it was Utah, the Utah big man, and uh, I just remember writing about that, the replay of it, ESPN going crazy about it, and sort of like it, it became the start of Joel Embiid's moment at Kansas where it was like, who is this guy? Where did he come from? And what is the future for him? If you just watch some Akeem Olajuwon videos and all of a sudden you can perform the dream shake like he did. So there was that one. And then obviously uh, the Uncle Anthony play, which will long be remembered for Kansas, which is Wayne Selden in the Big 12 tournament dunking his one-handed hammer dunk over the top of a Baylor player uh, and his uncle Anthony out in the crowd going crazy with the clock <laughs> around his neck. Uh, and, and one of those moments, I think that, uh, you know, will be long shown on highlight films for Kansas just because of uh, the gravity of it and just how forceful it was. And again, the crowd going nuts. I, I would add to that. The, uh, the, the, I think the first big 12 championship, the KU won at sprint center was, uh, uh, KU over Texas in 2008, and Mario Chalmers had a 30 point game. Oh, very in, good. Yes, in the, in the championship, and that was the Durant had left, but DA, DJ Augustine was there, and was a really really good Texas team. So um, one of the better games I can remember. All right, Callister hasn't been a Big 12 championship for Kansas State there or anywhere for a while a, a tournament championship, but they've had some good moments at Sprint Center. Can you? What, what are a couple that stand out for you? I got a few, probably not as many as Jesse. He's got a, a lot larger uh, inventory <laughs> than me. Um, but I will say the three that come to mind, you know, oddly, the loudest I've ever heard it in there for K State was there was a game in, oh, I guess it would have been 2010 at the time where uh, they played UNLV and they showed up and it shocked everybody. That that was the game that uh, Jacob Pullen and Curtis Kelly, their two best players, got suspended for like oh, three yeah. games, yeah. like right at tip off. 
And I, I don't know, it's just kind of weird. Like everybody's wondering what was going on, but the crowd kind of took it upon themselves to lift the team up and basically be the sixth man. Um, it, was, it was a sellout. K State lost the game, but um, I remember Nick Russell hit a shot at halftime, like a half court shot to close out the first half. And the crowd just, I mean, blew the roof off the place. It was the loudest I'd ever heard it for a K State game. So that, that was kind of a neat memory. Um, I also remember they played a regular season game there against Texas AM where uh, AM was actually ranked and they had just an epic, epic lapse on defense and let Wesley a one two run, get a rebound on one side of the court and run in a straight line to the other end and throw down a tomahawk dunk. I mean, without anybody coming with coming in within eight feet of him, uh, that that was pretty crowd pleasing. But I'd say their best moment was probably in Bruce Weber's first season. Um, there were still a lot of doubts on him. You know, there still obviously are some people who who have doubts with him. But that first year, he didn't have a signature victory um, through December, and then they they hosted Florida in there when they were a top ten team. And K State beat him really good, and that was uh, kind of the first thing that signaled that, hey, um, this team's pretty good, and they went on to actually share the Big 12 championship that season with KU. So that was probably their their top moment in the uh, in the old Sprint Center. Rest in peace. Hey, yeah. hey two things, Blair. I, I do want to say this. So I was wrong with Utah. It was New Mexico that, uh, that Joel right. Embiid schooled inside and uh, made fools of. But, okay, the Sprint Center goes back. I'm not, This one's probably Kemper, but I just have to bring it up just in case, because it's got to be on that line somewhere. The, the celebration, the early celebration with the number one, um, help me out with the name, Kellis. Was that a Sprint Center memory or was that not a Sprint Center memory? The uh, the player who stole the inbound pass, ran around with the basketball, holding up his oh, finger with the oh, number oh, one. Yeah. <laughs> Dallas. <laughs> oh, was, yeah. oh, okay. All right. So uh, not a Sprint Center yeah. memory. Yeah. Curtis Basco. The, when he lost the pet. Uh, yes. Yes. That the pet, was in the Pasco fiasco, remember that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was in Dallas. The only hey, the one I would add to the uh, to the K State list. It wasn't a win, but I just remember the electricity in the building the night that uh, they played Duke, and it was the championship game of the um, CBE Classic. And you had Jacob Pullen against Kyrie Irving. One of the like ten college games that Kyrie Irving played. Uh, for Duke, and he was he was really good. Duke won the game, but I just remember thinking, how cool is this with Kansas State and Duke in downtown Kansas City, and there were like eighteen thousand in the building, and it was just a phenomenal atmosphere that night. So, uh, look, the only thing that changed at Sprint is the uh, it was the name of the building. It's got the magenta on there instead of the magenta of the T-Mobile instead of the the uh, the, the yellow of Sprint. But uh, uh, there'll be many many more great games played there, hopefully soon. All right, Callis Robinette, Jesse Newell, thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you again soon. That will do it for today. Thanks to our production staff of Derek Donovan, Randy Mason, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, Savannah Smith, and Chris Fickett. Tip of the cap to Callis Robinette and Jesse Newell for stopping by and talking K-State, KU, and the Big 12. And links to their stories can be found in the show notes on KansasCity.com and on Kansas.com. Hey, earlier in the episode, you heard me talk about the Sports Pass offer. It still stands, still a good one, 30 bucks for a year's worth of sports coverage, and that includes Sports Extra that comes with the E-Edition. There's 48 additional pages of national sports coverage today. Here's an even better offer. Buy the entire Kansas City Star product. News, sports, features, commentary, and analysis. You get all the stories written by my talented colleagues, plus additional news, sports, and business coverage. The details can be found at account. KansasCity.com slash subscribe. That's account dot KansasCity.com slash subscribe. And whether it's the sports pass or the full subscription, you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports BKC. Thanks for listening. We'll be back on Thursday with another episode.